Welcome to the next chapter of Evernight by Ross Mackenzie. Um, today's chapter is the 11th chapter. It is called The Secret Cargo. Lara had never been on a boat before. She hadn't thought about that until she stepped onto the gangplank, onto Dragonfly's deck. The sensation was strange, standing on the wooden boards, feeling the hunking weight of the boat sway and move underfoot. The crystal sound rang clearer in her mind and the din of the docks faded away. There was a strange charge in Lara's blood. Her skin was all goose flesh and it seemed that she was moving around in a dream. She listened, letting the heart tugging sound guide her until she found a hatch on the decking, loosened the bolt and opened it. At once the sound grew louder and the buzz of her locket became a hum, warmth spilling from it. The space below was dark and her heart fluttered as she descended the creaking wooden steps and stood in the mouth of an empty cargo hold, squinting into the dark. The place felt alive, like she was in the guts of a great creature. The air was flavoured with the ghosts of a thousand cargoes. In the belly of the boat, she followed the trace of the noise until her eyes came upon something in the darkness. A small patch of purple-blue light was shining through the boards from below. A secret compartment. Lara let out a long, slow breath and gathered her senses. There was no handle, no gap wide enough to insert a lever. She crouched and as her hands explored the rough wooden boards, she found just off centre, one section that felt a little different. She pressed on the board, felt it give a little under her pressure. A great wave of excitement crashed over her as she pressed again, this time more forcefully. There was the sound of cogs and wheels and she jumped back as the, latch, as the hatch door lowered and she slipped sideways to reveal a square hole in the floor from which a bright glow spilled, dancing on the ceiling of the hold in swirls and shimmers. She edged forward, her eyes widening and her mouth falling open in wonder. There, hidden under the floor, were a great many little glass bottles. Inside each bottle was a wisp of glowing light. There were greens and blues, violets and reds, and they all swirled and winked inside their bottles, like living things. All about the many blazing bottles, the air crackled with energy and power. And Lara knew, deep in the same part of her that had been unable to resist coming aboard this boat, that she was in the presence of wild magic, hag magic. I should be running she thought, running far away from here. These spells could kill me. And if the coppers were here to find me, had magic near it, they'd, they'd have me swinging from a noose. But Lara did not run. She could not. The sound of the spells had bewitched her and wrapped her in warmth and wonder. She longed to touch one of the bottles and she found herself leaning over reaching into the secret compartment, brushing the stoppers with her fingertips. She chose one of the smallest bottles, plucked it from among the packing hay and held it in her hand. It was warm against her skin. The spell inside was the colour of the sea on a summer's day. She held it close to her face, peered at it and watched it swirl and shimmer and twine around the inside of the glass. Suddenly the spell flared so bright that it dazzled Lara and the bottle became white hot. She let it drop and it smashed when it hit the wooden deck. Lara stood in the darkness, blinded, gasping. The air had changed, become sweet and cold and there were popping and cracking sounds. When her vision returned, Lara could not believe what she was seeing. Trees and plants were growing 
inside the boat, bursting through the boards and sprouting up, branches twisting and reaching and filling the dark. These impossible plants became so thick and dense that it seemed to Lara she was standing in a forest. Panic filled her and she came to her senses, climbing and scrabbling and pushing her way up the wooden steps to the outside world once again. There was a man on the gangplank. He was mountainous, most of his face hidden behind a red beard, and he stopped with the shock of seeing this strange young girl on his boat. The man stared at Lara, and she stared back, and it seemed for a moment that neither of them knew what to do. Then the deck between Lara's feet burst upwards, and the branch of a great tree reached out into the daylight and sprouted yellow leaves. The man's eyes grew wild and wide, and he swung around to check that nobody on the docks had noticed what was going on. Then he turned to Lara, rage and disbelief on his face. My dragonfly, what have you done? Um, Lara searched through the great catalogue of excuses she'd accumulated through the years as a tosher and occasional thief. It weren't me, mister. I was walking past, minding my own business, when I saw a bunch of lads jumping on board this fine boat of yours. I said to myself, I said, they're up to no good, and I chased them off, but not before they'd done some damage. He reached into his coat, pulled out a wooden stick, fitted with a revolver chamber. Frozen, Lara watched him fumble in his coat until he brought out a tiny bottle and loaded it into one of the chambers. He stepped onto the deck, raised the wand, and pointed it down into the cargo hold. Lara took her chance. She rushed past him, avoiding his free arm as he reached for her, and sprinted over the gangplank and away through the docks, not daring to look back.